hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. Autumn is certainly approaching and it means that we have a bit of time on our hands. Well, apart from all of the gluts. And this here is one of the gardens here. That's our permaculture project. This was going to be very much experimental, but the secret garden project took over. I know it's getting really exciting now. It's almost time to announce it. So this kind of just turned into where all of the spares, all of the spare seedlings would go. And next year, moving forward, because this is going to become more perennial based for the rest of the site, I thought this would be a great example to almost create a staples garden and grow a lot of it to help with self-sufficiency. And it's split up into a bunch of raised beds. We've got 12 raised beds here. So I thought I'd run through the process of how I do a garden plan just very simple so you can understand it because it's a great thing to do over autumn when things are still fresh and you can still look at things and you know I've got some some nice peas to snack on but also over winter so yeah just gonna show you the process I'm gonna turn over a new page and the most important thing is whenever you're doing any kind of plan is the first draft should just be rough and ready and you can make a nice tidy draft later on but yeah rough and ready because there's gonna be things that change for any kind of garden planning you want to start with the base map this is just taking into account all of the physical kind of permanent structures that aren't going to be moved for example raised beds and fences and I, I I like to do this you know you can do it online but I like to do it with a pencil and then it is kind of going to be sketchbook mentality so we're going to be thinking about what we're going to be planting a little bit later on but it's nice to just do a few doodles and you know put your personality onto it because it's quite fun looking back at previous years and seeing how that plan has changed so just to begin these raised beds here are three meters by 1.2 meters so four foot by ten foot they're the kind of standard raised bed size that I really like and because it's just a draft I'm just going to hand hand draw these out just kind of very roughly just so I know I've got the approximate shape and you don't really need to do it exactly to scale you just got to make sure that you have the gist so I set myself a fun challenge because I forgot a, a rubber. So this is going to be super rough and ready. And I think it's an, important, it's an important showcase that it doesn't need to be perfect. But I've got it laid out and I've got plenty of space around the page. I'm using a large page because I want to make a bunch of notes. And to start with, if it's going to be a garden, um, which it obviously is, you want to think about what are your goals of the garden. So one thing I'm going to going to mention is like put down some goals for this garden because I want it to be staples and it's very much self-sufficiency focused the goal is is to provide an abundance of food I also want it to look quite aesthetic because within a garden there's there's multiple functions or multiple benefits that you can start to, to stack up so as well as it as well as it providing an abundance of food I want it to to look beautiful and one of the ways that you do that is both by working with structure so being clever about where you might put vertical structures but also thinking about color and we think about color we're talking about flowers pollinators beneficial insects helping with the pests and disease everything links together nicely so to look beautiful in in um, brackets i'm just going to put um, working with the vertical and pollinators so these are just key words to refer to as i'm doing the planning process i can refer back to these um, as a goal and also the final goal is I want it to actually be quite simple to carry out. I don't want this to take a lot of time. I want to make sure that it's nice and efficient. So just making sure it's efficient. And doing this initial plan is probably the easiest way to make sure it is efficient because rather than thinking what to do next halfway during the growing season, you just refer to your plan. One of the things that I like to do is, is to use mind maps and just like let thoughts lead the way. So in terms of here, there's a few things uh, with the goals. So when I'm talking about pollinators and what to grow, I know that there's a few things that I'm absolutely going to include. So astertiums, calendula, maybe a bit of borage. Uh, those are kind of the standards 
uh, maybe some coriander, just so I can get some nice colour and it, it and include the, the pollinators. The other thing that I then do is I like to, before I start thinking about the actual food, I like to dedicate certain space of, of the garden with regards to where to put these pollinator crops. So the next stage is I look at the plant, I look at the raised beds, and I actually section off space for pollinators. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this marker, you can use different colors, but in red, it's space that is designated to maybe planting a row of calendula or nasturtiums. And you've got to think about the growing habit. So nasturtiums are going to be south facing. So you might want to put a, a key on your map and point to where south is. And that will help you work with layers. You want the taller things at the back, the shorter things at the front. Things like nasturtiums, they like to cascade. So I, I think some, some nasturtiums along the edges would work nicely. And because I, I like to keep these pollinator sections kind of very polycultury and wild, I like to just block off, say, a third or a quarter of a raised bed at a time and then work with that. And I like to make sure that I have it spreading throughout the garden. And I've got to think about the, the entry points because I want to think about when I'm walking into the garden, I want to get hit with a load of colour, but also colour in the background that is pulling me through the garden. And so in terms of the, the gates, just to signify where the posts are, just to show the, like, the main entrance points coming into the garden, just an arrow just to help, because that's gonna kind of influence the visuals of how things happen. Because if I want vertical structures, I might want something that's quite close up that forces me to look behind it and it reveals a different view. Those are, those are the gates. And the other thing that's really useful is to understand like your key, areas with regards to where, where you walk, what are the most trodden paths. So just to make it a bit simpler, I'm going to now put in the fence and there's a couple of other things that's quite useful. I've got an IBC tank right next to me here. So I'm just gonna make a note of that because it's useful and that's where, that's where the water is. In terms of the, I, I want a bit of splash of color at every entry point at the garden. So I'm going to, section off this part. I'm going to section off this nice entrance. And remember, these are for pollinators, but everything that I grow in a pollinator section is also going to be edible. Um, so there's, I don't see it as any waste whatsoever. So those are the main ones. And then I just think about, okay, is there a part of the garden that may be missing some color? And up here, there isn't much happening. So I just think something kind of in the middle there will help balance throughout. And it means that as pollinators are coming through, there's a bit in each kind of corner and area. So those are all designated for pollinators. And then what you might want to do is you can do a bit of a key somewhere just to remind yourself. So I'll just do a little box there and I will make sure that that is for pollinator polyculture. And it's a bit like when you're doing labels, seed labels, you've got to make sure that you do the seed label there and then of the variety, because no matter how many times you say, oh yeah, I'll remember what variety that is, you're gonna forget. So it's the same thing with annotating this. So the structure is, is beginning um, to fill up, and I want to think about what do I actually want to grow there? So I like to make um, a bit of a list, and the other thing is I wanna think about visual structures, and I want this to be kind of, it's a draft, but I want it to be, feeling quite nice. So one of the things that I absolutely love is vertical structures with runner beans and how beautiful they are. So it's like, you know, feel free to, to do like little doodles. So up in this kind of top corner, just they serve as like little reminders. Do a very simple one here. Nice little fun little sketch. And it's nice to do that because it's autumn and we have time on our hands and uh, yeah. But October is summer holidays for gardeners, so I'm excited for that next month. The next stage is, I know these are the pollinator sections, and I now actually want to make my list of, of what to grow. I've got this, this space here, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna create a little box just to separate it and what I want to grow. So this is almost like creating a menu, but it's a menu of the garden. I, I might even call it that. There's no real, right or wrong menu and this is for 
the 2024 menu of the garden. And I'm only going to be thinking about staples here. So of course there's going to be potatoes and I'm going to look at new potatoes rather than uh, uh, main crop just because I want to bring in succession as well. So I'm going to put this, just so you know, this way of planning can, even if you have one raised bed, you can condense the scale. You can condense it into single rows. Don't think that you have to have lots of raised beds to do this. It's, uh, it's very flexible in terms of how you wish to approach it. I also think that the smaller the, the space, the more creative you have to get and the more interesting it becomes. So it's, it's a good thing. Potatoes, onions, carrots, garlic, field beans, peas, runner beans, courgette, squash, leeks. I've got my, I've got my menu. Now I wanted to talk about salads in particular because there's a nice way of approaching salads. It's kind of your, your the, the raised bed or the area of the garden where you can go for lunch. I like to dedicate a section of the garden or in this case one bed just to salads and that's why I make sure that every two or three weeks I sow like a new row of lettuce or spinach or radish throughout the growing season so I've always got leaves. So. I need to think about which access point is the, is the one that is the closest, say closest to your house, and you want your salads to be as close as possible to that, just because you can go in. Now, there is a reverse one where you can have it as far away as possible, so you have to look through your garden to, to get there, just like they put milk far away in the supermarket, but we're gonna keep things nice and simple. So this is the main access. So this bed here is now dedicated to salads. So we're already starting to, to fill things in. Now I've got runner beans and peas. These are vertical structures and these are kind of more important to put in before all of the other ones. And you have to make sure that they um, maybe don't cast shade or they do cast shade because sometimes shade is nice and important. And what do salads not really like during the middle of summer? Too much sun, they can bolt a little bit. So what you could do here for the salad bed is put, say, I'm gonna stick to the, the, the vertical like wigwam style trellises and I'm gonna um, put three in this bed in front just to provide some dappled shade behind. And I'm just gonna put RB for runner beans. And because that is a bed of legumes and they'll be kind of, I'm gonna put field beans in there as well, just to keep things easy. I don't always follow, well, I don't follow crop rotation, but sometimes it's easier to group things together. So we've got field beans. Um, so when you've, when you've done something, I can then turn that into a plus, just so I know I've already got runner beans. That's more than enough. Uh, field beans, got that as well. Peas is next. Again, they do like vertical and they do need quite a lot of harvesting, but I'm gonna have them a little bit further away. So I'm gonna do peas, but in succession, I'm gonna have one row of peas to start with and then another row of peas to begin um, to continue later on. So I'll do one long row at the back and I'll call them peas one. And I'm not going to go down into months of like when to plant because it's gonna be very much dependent on, on your circumstance. But the idea is like for for me, the first row of peas might go in in March, the second row might go in in May, and this is where succession comes in. But I'll do more of a succession masterclass uh, at some other point, but you'll just get the gist. This is just the process. So um, out here, just to keep things separate and the idea of polyculture, not putting all of your eggs in one basket in case there's some like powdery mildew or something, I can put the other row of peas further away. Now it's a case of thinking about, I've got all of these things, what needs more space? So I've got courgette, but also like squash, winter squash. Courgette, we don't need that much space. We'll need kind of like one, one third of a raised bed because they take up not much space, but they produce a huge amount of food and it's easy to get overrun. So what I can do here in the front, because courgettes are quite low growing, I can actually, roughly that'll take up a third of a bed for the peas. I can split it down the middle, and then in here I can put my courgette, aka zucchini. So I've done, I've done courgette. Um, in terms of winter squash, I want something that, like pumpkins, I want them to trail. And I know I've got a lot of space out here 
where you know I might put some compost bins in the future but I want these pumpkins to be able to spread out so if I could have maybe a couple again putting things together of squash I can do that here or if there's again a little case of powdery mildew and I want to keep them a little bit further apart rather than where the leaves are touching then the transmission is easy I'm actually going to dedicate kind of this third of the bed and I'll just put pumpkins for now that the idea with the pumpkins and I'm just going to do like just a little sketch just to imagine it just with pencil the, the pumpkins kind of like come out and trail and you've got pumpkins growing out and you have to find them under the leaves which is always great fun so I'm happy with that now in terms of some big ones that are going to take up a whole raised bed at least things like potatoes onions I'd say carrots leeks for sure and this is where I'm going to be using a bit of my own succession planting so usually if I grow new potatoes when I when I harvest those I can then transplant my leeks so I'm going to do uh, new potatoes but also um, main crop potatoes which are going to be later on um, to use like my sapo mirrors so where I'm going to have a transition I'll put new potatoes leeks and that bed is all sorted here again if I'm wanting to split things up with the polyculture I might put my um, I might put my main crop potatoes here and then I do like a lot of garlic so I'll probably do a whole bed of garlic and when you harvest your main crop potatoes that'll be August September and then I'm going to plant my garlic for 2025 right after those main crop potatoes so main crop potatoes then garlic the more growing seasons you run through the easier it is to start to work out timings with your climate and what swaps each thing so we've got our potatoes in we've got the first bit of garlic but here um, I'm going to dedicate where I'm going to plant garlic this year maybe a whole bed is a little bit too much so I'm going to put garlic in this bed and you harvest garlic kind of July time so once you've harvested garlic you can then transplant things like um, just about purple sprouting broccoli uh, or beetroot um, then purple sprouting which I would have started at least a month or two beforehand and I'm just growing them on in kind of one litre tubs to then transplant so we've got purple sprouting we've got a garlic uh, next thing is onions really really important um, at least a bed of onions so I'll put onions here and then I'll add a bit of fertility and make sure after onions I was just making sure leeks is off uh, I will follow that with winter cabbage like savoy cabbage you could also do spring cabbage here as well and then all I've got left really is carrots and beetroot and I'm going to split those up into two sowings so you get your your succession so because I want to get carrots and beetroot for as much of the season as possible carrot one and then beet one and then I'll do a similar thing here again keeping it further away carrot two beet two so there we have all of the staples now nice and easy planned out you've noticed that we do have some spare areas if it's your garden you want to make sure that at least 10 to 20 percent of your space is free because you might suddenly forget about something that you're meant to plant and then you realize you have no space so find maybe that 10 percent and just shade it out so it's actually not dedicated to anything until when the time's right you might suddenly think oh i could actually do with a bit more this or a bit more that now in my case because this is a staples i might want to think about more of something that i want to grow so i always know that i can looking at this i i know i could always do with more potatoes um, and more onions so what i'm going to do is i'm going to 
adds another space for potatoes in this little area. So that's just some extra. Um, and the nice thing is you want to find things, if you are trying to fill up, things that store nice and well. So potatoes, onions, garlic, all of those work well. So for onions, I'm going to add another half bed of onions. And then because this is connected to our the rest of the growing site, I do want a little bit of space for where I might have extra of something or I might be growing a particular variety and it doesn't fit in the secret garden. I still want to be able to grow it. So I'm also going to shade off this area here and this area here to dedicate for that. So that is roughly the, the planning process for a garden plan in a nutshell. So the nice thing about making a garden planting plan at the tail end of a growing season is that there's going to be certain varieties that have worked really well for you and now's a good time to actually using this space because there's still more space to fill up and I want this to be really useful and I might not actually need to make a nice tidy version but I might want to laminate it and then I can use it next year but keeping track of the varieties that you really like I like to call them kind of like hero varieties, ones that I know are my defaults or, or go-to varieties. So I'm actually going to use this like little section here to talk or to, to mention my hero for... I can't even spell. For, for Just so you know, I learned to spell uh, Welsh before English. So it's my second language. Anyway, I got there in the end, I think, but it's a bit of fun. So I'm just going to list some of my, my ones. What I'll do is like, whatever the crop is say beetroot i'll do that in capital and then the variety in in lowercase yeah i'd say make a little note of challenges of the prior growth growing season because you can just at least bear this in mind for the upcoming growing season rather than thinking actually it's okay and then forgetting about it and then it happens again so one might be like you want a, a bit more of an established irrigation setup or perhaps you had a huge amount of slug damage so it's just making notes of um of this year's challenges ready for next year really important thing when you're doing a garden plan is to just make it nice and creative there's no right or wrong just make it as you wish as colorful as you want as plain as you want as illustrative as you want and if you're wanting to unlock your creativity and learn something new or some new skills over autumn and winter then i recommend you check out skillshare who are supporting today's video skillshare has a bunch of different creative courses out there one is sketchbook composition and layout that's one that i have not taken as you can obviously see and it's one that i do want to take because i do enjoy taking a sketchbook to the garden and making different notes and i could always make it feel a little bit better um, I might always revert back to the haphazardness that is my brain, but also other things. If you're interested in animation, creative writing, photography as well, graphic design, watercolor, it's, it's perfect. Perhaps you're looking to start a little side project or you want to take your creativity to the next stage and make it your career. Well, the good news is Skillshare can cater for that as well. There's a lot of creative career focused classes out there that look at entrepreneurship, productivity, efficiency, freelancing, marketing, all of the useful things to create your own little small business, doing the thing that you love. One of my favorite things about Skillshare, which I've been using for a few years now, is that whatever you feel like exploring or discovering and whatever category it is, there are classes out there. Like at the moment, I'm finding myself going down the rabbit hole of AI. I don't know kind of where I stand on it, but in terms of art, is it art? Who knows? It's a, it's a big debate out there, but there are some classes to go check out and that's what I'm looking at at the moment. So the good news is for you, I have a little gift for the first 1000 people that use the link down below in the video description you get a month free use of Skillshare. That's a lot of things that you can do in that time. A month gives you plenty of time to make a far more beautiful garden plan than mine. And if you want to brag about it, you know, be my guest. I'll be really excited to see how you've planned your garden as well. And also down below, I've linked to three classes in particular that I enjoy as a kind of my starting point.
One of my top tips when you create a garden plan is just like you've done for the raised beds where you've left some spare gaps, you want to leave a little bit of a spare gap on your, your main page because I'd like you to leave it for a week and come back and review it, see what happens. You can always make changes. If you are expecting changes, then when you're writing down what to put in the beds, do it in pencil, but I feel pretty happy with how this is looking. And then over winter, you'll find yourself anything that you think that will be useful that you want to refer back to next year, you want to leave a little bit of space just so you can continue filling it up. So come springtime, you can. You know, one of the things that came to mind is I want to make sure, you know, we've got a little space here for perhaps a little fire to, to make it a nice environment to be in in the evenings. And I've also written down a list of all of the jobs that I need to do in March, which isn't actually that much, but it kind of shows you how you can plan each month. Uh, a little healthy soil strategy and then a few ideas on the shed. But that is the basics of creating a a garden planting plan. I hope you've enjoyed. Thanks again to Skillshare for supporting today's video and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Any questions, let me know down below.